Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to Jimmy Scott Fitness Podcast Radio Show. Coming to you on this Saturday, October the October. I don't even know what month it is. November, November the seventh, twenty twenty. Hopefully, it finds you staying safe and staying sweaty and knowing what month it is, because clearly, I do not know what's going on. So, if that's any indication how this podcast is going to go, buckle up, you guys, for a bumpy, rambling, bunch of nonsense ride. Uh, I'm kidding, although I am tired and I am hungry, and it's odd that every time we do like these deep nutrition podcasts, I'm starving, which just makes me think about cinnamon rolls, cookies, french fries, and all the things that I'm probably not supposed to be eating, but more than likely want to get into. So, with that said, before we kick off on today's episode, reminder, it is November the 7th right now. We are about 50-some days away from 2021. And we are kicking off our 50 days of fitness fat loss challenge here in three days, three hours and 37 minutes and counting down. If you are interested in doing the final challenge here with us in 2020, the link is in my Instagram bio, or you can shoot me a message ASAP and we'll give you a small podcast discount code to get you guys in. It is an accountability group. It is 50 days of activity. Uh, there's a ton of stuff programmed in there. I think there's seven or eight guides total. So there's a lot, whether you train in the gym, whether you train at home, you can do the entire thing with just dumbbells. If you have more access to stuff, you can do even crazier things than that. I'm going to share a ton of my stuff in the private Facebook group along the way. And, uh, it's just, it's one of my favorite challenges to do personally with everybody, just because it keeps me from eating all the pies and cookies and cakes and, and doing the normal stuff that uh, we would do during the holidays. And so uh, for the last, I think the first, I don't know if I did it the first or second year, maybe I did, I can't remember. I just know I've taken it really serious probably the last five or six years of doing it. And it really started from me noticing I ate and drank like shit during the holidays and I'd find myself blowing up, which was fine, you know, within reason when I was kind of in the bodybuilding life, because like you get big, you get shredded, you kind of do this you know, binge and fast kind of lifestyle, which it works, but it's not healthy. Like you can end up looking okay at the end of it when you're young enough, but as you get older, things don't bounce back as quick. And I found myself feeling like a bloated, basically piece of shit uh, come January. And it's like, it's just not a healthy place to be. And it, it doesn't lead to healthy eating habits. And it's just not great, especially during the time of year where you're moving less, eating and drinking more, uh, you're probably staying inside more, it's colder, uh, cold and flu season, all the things just kind of add into you being not your healthiest. And I just thought it was counterintuitive to how we live the rest of the year. So that is where this challenge started from. So if you're interested, hit me up. 50 days of fitness challenge. We will kick off on the 11th. So you guys have just over three days to hit me up to get down with that. Now, in terms of today's podcast, uh, I've got a great piece here from uh, my homies at uh, Precision Nutrition. We're talking the five universal principles of good nutrition uh, in that regard. And I believe uh, Ryan Michel wrote this, uh, RD, as well as Alyssa Bauman put a couple pieces together. Now, I'm gonna uh, pick and choose uh, and take the parts that I want to share with you guys to give you just some basic outline information and then we'll go as deep as uh, I can before I crash here and need to uh, eat some cookies because I'm hungry. Like I said, when I'm hungry, my brain starts going crazy just like a lot of you guys. That's the key. Try not to let yourself get too too crazy hungry before you eat, but that's where I'm at today. So with that, I am going to drop this really quick before we even dig into the podcast. I shared this on our newsletter. So if you guys are on our newsletter, you saw this come in this morning. If you're not, hit me up. I'm happy to throw your email onto the list. We send out three emails a week, every week minimum. I've done that for over 11 years now. And some weeks when we do like product launches, like our 50 days, I send out an email every single day, usually for about 10 days in a row. And it's not just sales emails. I'm not trying to sell you guys anything. We market stuff, obviously, if you choose to buy it, great. But in everything we do, I try to give valuable information. I very rarely try to do just a uh, sales post or something. It's just not my thing. I don't feel like I should have to sell you on wanting to eat better and feel better and move better. That just seems like it's common sense to me. But in the newsletter today, this is what I shared. It's a thing titled Two Facts. Now, I wrote this a couple of years ago, but it rings just as true now uh, more than ever. And I'm actually going to share it on uh, IGTV uh, for people who don't listen to podcasts, although most of you who listen, follow us on Instagram and you're kind of all in the same house, but 
just in case. And it goes like this, and I quote, your current body and your current life are a result of the life choices you have made up to this point. And let me preface this by saying, I understand that we all don't start off, you know, at the same level. Life is not fair. Admittedly, you know, there's been a lot of shit I've had to eat in my life, just like many of you listening. I didn't start off with a lot. I wasn't given anything. I didn't start off my life on third base. I've had to, you know, kind of scrap and claw and fight my way to get here today. And I have to continue to do so every single day. Otherwise, I'm going to drown and I'm not going to make it. Uh, I don't got a rich Uncle Rico who's going to leave me a million bucks. It just, every day I go home, I check the mail for, you know, envelopes full of cash. And literally, it's never there. Usually, it's just bills and uh, worthless political shit that comes in the mail right now. So I understand that it might not be fair and other people have gifts, but we all have shit, right? Like I have gifts, you have gifts. Some of yours are better than mine, some of mine are better than yours, and that's just kind of life. And take solace in knowing that your future body and your future life will be a result of the choices that you make moving forward. And it might be tough to hear, but like they say, the truth hurts. And obviously I've talked about this before on a, on a podcast you know, separately, probably like three or four years ago, but I think it's a nice reminder to hear. And knowing that making changes and transforming your life is going to take an enormous amount of consistency, effort, energy, sacrifice, and most importantly, patience, because everybody wants it to happen overnight. And uh, that's not how it works. It hasn't worked for me that way anyway. You know, we, we want it, we live in a microwave culture. We want it in, in moments, but it, it's more like a crock pot. You think it's going to happen in two minutes and it happens in 12 hours. That's kind of the scale you have to be looking at. And realistically, if you're trying to really make massive changes in your life, it is not easy. Very few people do it. And it starts with small daily changes to your rituals and your habits and your routines. And what you have to do is you have to begin to focus on the little things that you guys can control. How you spend your time. That's most important. How you spend your money. And if you want to know what somebody values, ask them, or maybe not even ask them because a lot of people are full of shit. Look at how they spend their time and money. That is what they value. Look at how they're spending their time and look at how they're spending their money and that is what those people value. When you start to focus on your time, your money, what success truly means to you, how often you wish to work out, what types of foods are you eating, do you track your macros, what kind of friends do you surround yourself with, do you invest in coaching, what books are you consuming? Which podcasts are you consuming? Hopefully the Jim's Got Fitness podcast. What kind of schedule do you abide by? Do you create your own schedule or do you let it just create it around your life? You know what I'm saying? Like, are you diligent with what you're doing, which we talked about yesterday actually on the podcast? How fast are you willing to execute on something you want to get done? And a million other little things that you control daily. So know if you're listening to this, if you want a better body, if you want a better paycheck, if you want a better relationship, if you want a better life, it starts with you and your choices. And that should be amazing news to hear because you are in control. You don't need anybody's okay. You don't need anybody's permission. You don't need anybody's approval to start making changes in terms of how you eat, how you sleep, how you live your life, and the things that you listen to and read and the people you surround yourself with. That is nobody's fault but yours if it's not going the way you want. You can literally, after hearing me say this, start implementing these small changes, which end up being massive, huge changes in your life right away. So now that you know the facts, what are you going to do? That's kind of the whole uh, preface of, of what I wrote and what I share with our people. And I say that because a lot of times, especially now, and you guys know me, I am not a political person. I don't know shit about politics. I am just a gorilla in a warehouse trying to help people. That's it. I don't get overly concerned with the things that I can't control. I'm not going to find myself arguing with people on the internet all day. I've said this before and I'll say it again. It matters more what happens at your house with you and your family than what happens at the White House. I've never believed that any politician or any party or any entity really gives a fuck about me. And it'd be hard pressed for me to start believing in that now. So I don't think anybody's gonna come save me. I don't think anybody's out to deliberately just crush me. I have to do the best with what I can do. And that starts with how I eat, how I sleep, the things I drink, the things I read, the people I associate with, and the amount of good I'm trying to do in the world. 
and you are the same there. And I, I understand you can't control what happens to you. It's 2020. I've got kicked in the nuts and punched in the face a couple of times at this point, as I have throughout a lot of parts of my life. All I can do is control how I react moving forward and try to be as positive as I can be and try to pivot and work as best I can dealing with the shit that is, you know, surrounding many of us at this point. So just know you're in control of the majority of the things. And regardless of like, you know, if we're talking politics, right, especially in America, because right now it's so polarizing each way, you know, I just don't think anybody is going to save you. I don't think anybody is, is really out to get you. I think you just have to do what's best for you. And uh, that's all any of us can do at the end of the day. You can make your voice heard, but really at the end of the day, just try to, to, to put more good out in the world than harm. And, and don't find yourself wasting countless hours worrying and arguing, especially with people and things that you're not going to change. That's just my side note before we kick into today's podcast on the five universal principles of good nutrition. So I'm going to dig in kind of one by one here. And again, it's not rocket science, but I do think these are things that are, are beneficial and that are helpful and hopefully lead you to feeling more confident in the things that you're going to eat and, and how you can move forward and be successful with food. Because when I look at the people here that are successful and the ones who might struggle more, it's usually the food. Not always. There's some people who crush it with the food, but then are a complete lazy ass when it comes to working out. But more often than not, the food is the biggest struggle for most people. And the first principle we're talking about is weight loss and weight gain. It comes down to one key equation. And everybody knows this one, uh, whether everybody wants to believe it or not. It's the energy balance equation, also known as, you know, kind of the, the calories in, calories out, or the CICO for short. And it looks like this, if you were to kind of write it down. Energy in minus energy out equals changes in the body stores. So in other words, when you take in more energy or calories than you burn, you're going to gain weight. When you take in more energy or calories than you burn, you're going to gain weight. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You can't tell me, well, Jeremy, I did not take in more calories than I burned, but I'm still gaining weight. That is not how it works. It's, it, this is not my opinion. This is science. This is math, right? It's like if you got 10 bucks and you only spent eight bucks, you still got two bucks. There's really no way around it, no matter what kind of guerrilla math you want to do. And I'm not a genius by any means. I went to the Math 101 tutor every single day in college. Shout out to Mr. Farndale. Appreciate you, bro. I, you helped me get here. Uh, but that's just how it is. When you take in less energy than you burn, you lose weight. When you take in less energy than you burn, you lose weight. When you take in the same energy as you burn, you guess what? Drum roll, please. You maintain. So you might be wondering, how do we know this with absolute certainty? Well, think of it this way. It's like gravity, right? The principle is easy to test. With gravity, you continually release a heavy object. No matter how many times you try it, it's going to fall. It's common sense. It's the same with the energy balance. If you reduce energy in and increase energy out, you always get the same result. Body weight goes down. Now, fat loss and weight loss are not the same thing and they're not exclusively together. And so I have to say that because sometimes people are gonna get confused. And we can go down that rabbit hole later if we need to, but just know if you reduce the energy in and increase the energy out, you always get the same result. Your body weight goes down. Second, the energy balance equation comes from the first law of thermodynamics, right? So energy can either be created or destroyed, only transferred from one state to another. I don't want to get lost here, but I think most of you care about this, so I'm going to repeat some of these things so they can sink in. The energy balance equation comes from the first law of thermodynamics. Energy can neither be created or destroyed. It only transfers from one state to another. Humans can't create energy from nothing. We just, we don't have the ability. It's like, we don't, we can't do magic, right? Unless you're Chris Angel, which 
I can't wait till the world is normal. I really do want to see Chris Angel. I just think Chris Angel's the shit. But that's a side note. So short of your Chris Angel, um, you can't create energy from nothing. We convert it from food. That's what humans do. Humans don't just create something from nothing. You can't turn wood into bricks. Like it just doesn't work that way. Like we need food to have energy. And any excess energy we take in doesn't magically vanish. Your body either increases the energy out, often by turning up the metabolism, or storing the excess. Scientific laws are as close to facts as we're probably going to get in life. And can they be updated over time? Sure. As we know better, we do better. There's a lot of things we used to think that now we don't think. We're becoming smarter, although sometimes it's, it's, tough, it's tough to think that if you go on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. But we are getting smarter. And so can things be updated over time? Sure. Um, and in this case, though, uh, the law has stood firm well over a century. And so that's what it is. And so why do some people say, well, not all calories are equal? Well, in a word, you know, confusion, right? Um, there's a lot of illustrations that can kind of help break this down. But to better understand the universal kind of energy balance, right? Circle back to the law that you studied in, in physics class, right? Like the law of gravity. So like energy balance, um, it represents like the equation, right? F equals MA. So force equals mass times acceleration. I think even an idiot like me remembers hearing things like this in school, even though I was half asleep and didn't really pay attention. But that basic equation applies to every object dropped from any height, right? So, but like a lot of factors affect it, uh, air resistance, uh, again, making it seem like it isn't true. Similarly with food and human, the basic equation never really changes. It's true all foods consumed in all situations, but a lot of factors can affect different parts of the equation. So what does that mean to you? Jeremy, you're rambling on, you sound like a crazy person. Well, if someone wants to gain or lose body mass, they'll have to consider the overall energy balance and how to shift it in their favor. And here's a couple ways to do it, right? To reduce calories in, you can consume fiber-rich vegetables to reduce the number of calories your body absorbs. You can consume more protein to reduce appetite, therefore overall energy intake. You can eat slowly so you can tune into your hunger and fullness signals and stop eating when you're satisfied, not stuffed. You can use hand portions to guide how much you eat. You can get enough sleep to reduce hunger cravings and sweets and so on. That would be how to reduce the calories that are coming into your body. Well, how can I increase the calories that are coming out? You could add more cardio to burn calories. You could go for a 20 minute walk a day if you're not walking at all. You can add strength training to build more muscle to boost your overall metabolism and burn more calories. As we've talked about before on this podcast, your muscle is your metabolism. The more lean tissue you have on your body, the more efficient you're going to be at rest just living life. You can increase your overall daily activity by taking the stairs, parking further away from the grocery store, uh, using a step tracker to get your steps at at least 10,000 steps per day. Whatever it is, there's little things you can do to increase those calories. Again, you can boost your protein intake to increase the thermic effect of digestion if you want to go down that rabbit hole. And you can practice self-care to reduce stress and improve your sleep, both important for a healthy metabolism. All we're trying to do is get your body to burn as much at rest as humanly possible. So hopefully you, you haven't lost me there. Obviously, you know, when people say, you know, all calories um, are not equal, I, I think we're talking like food quality, right? Like, and that's when I say, uh, and, and I'll, I'll go, I'll go down, I'll play devil's advocate for you, right? Like all calories are not equal. If you want to talk about, again, at the end of the day, if, you, if you're eating, if 1500 calories puts you at weight loss, you're going to lose weight. Whether you eat 1,500 calories of legit food or 1,500 calories of Sour Patch Kids, you can lose weight just eating Sour Patch Kids. You can lose weight just eating McDonald's. You can lose weight just eating pure processed shit. That can't happen. It's a numbers game. Now, how you feel, how you look, uh, your overall health, that is going to be drastically different if you ate all processed garbage or ate real food. Now... If you're 
if for you to be in like this fat loss mode, you had a GB under, let's say, let's just go carbohydrates because it's just an easy example and that's just what came to my mind. If it's 100 carbs per day, if those 100 carbohydrates were made up of Brussels sprouts, asparagus, and oatmeal, or they were made up of Sour Patch Kids and candy corn, you technically can be the same weight and, and you can lose weight both ways. I just think over time, when you look at the micronutrients and how you're going to feel, I think it's gonna be drastically different. And that's why I say like, the calories aren't the same. Even though the calories are the same, the volume of food you can eat in Brussels sprouts compared to like Sour Patch Kids is drastically different. So hope that makes sense when I'm saying that, when you guys follow me, but at the end of the day, it is calories in, it is calories out. Now how you diversify those calories, I think is gonna have a, a huge take on body composition for sure, but not necessarily in terms of weight loss, if you're following me here. That's why I say weight loss and fat loss are not exclusively the same because you can lose a bunch of weight and the, the ratios might not be what you want it to be. And then manipulating what you want your body composition to look like moving forward obviously is tough and that's why you have to kind of drill down on stuff. Again, I'm not vilifying carbohydrates or fats or proteins or anything. I'm just trying to paint the calories in, calories out picture. Principle number two. Protein is the most important macronutrient to get right. Why is that? Two main reasons. One, it helps you eat less without feeling so hungry. Now, research consistently shows that protein helps you feel fuller for longer, and as a result, can help you lose weight. Again, these all play off of the same premises. Now that in part because it takes longer for the body to break down protein than it does for, let's say, carbohydrates and fats. Protein also stimulates the release of the satiety hormones in the gut. So when you eat protein, you naturally tend to eat less. And on a side note, like when I did uh, like my carnivore diet experiment, and again, I'm not telling anybody to do that. I'm not going to say do what I do. I'm just laying out here things that I've done in the past to help kind of paint a clearer picture. And when I did the carnivore diet, I found myself losing weight, being leaner for sure, because I did eat a lot less. Because when you're eating a ton of meat, you just, you find yourself not overeating. Even though it's, I love meat, more than, probably more as much as anybody in the world, for sure. I love everything. I love steak. I love carne asada. Uh, I love fish. I love shrimp. I even love certain kinds of chicken. I love bacon. I love it all, dude. I love all the hams. I'm really just a meat fan. There's very few things, even organ meats, uh, you know, I'll, I'll eat... Uh, I'll, I'll try a liver. I'll eat it if you if you cook it the right way and make it the right way. I'm, I'm down for damn near everything. Now that I'm a meat dude for sure. Like I remember the first time I discovered Fogo de Chao as a young, as a young strapping uh, kid in the bodybuilding game. I'm like, this is great. I just flip my card over and they keep bringing meat over and over and over and over again. It's awesome. Now, the, the shits you take, uh, the, you get a certain different kind of diarrhea coming out of your butt, but man, it is, uh, it, it's worth it, at least for me. Uh, probably not for many of you listening, but uh, that's it. So anyways, when you eat a high level of protein, you naturally tend to uh, to eat less overall. At least that's that's been the case for me. And it makes a big difference. For a lot of you listening, uh, I'm adrenalized here, women uh, specifically, and not just women, but dudes tend to eat more meat than women do. But I also know some, some ladies who can put it down. But... Uh, when you double your protein intake, uh, it could help you, you know, spontaneously consume maybe 400 fewer calories per day. Um, for reference, that's roughly the number of calories of a, a cup and a half of ice cream, if you will. And so on the, the PN article here, you know, test the power of protein for yourself. And this is kind of the test that they lay out. On one day, eat six to eight ounces of plain skinless chicken every meal and then track your hunger for the rest of the day, rating it once an hour on a scale of like one to five. Now the following day, eat one to two cups of cooked pasta in each meal, and again, track the hunger on a scale of one to five. And then take a look at your data and see which method resulted in a higher hunger ratings over the course of the day. I tend to find the carbohydrates I tend to want to overconsume, and it also, for me personally, I feel like it perpetuates these, this hunger cycle where if I eat dense amounts of protein, I feel like I'm a lot fuller for a lot longer. That's why the eating two big ass meals for me per day, or sometimes just one meal per day, works the best. The second reason here I wanna talk about is protein makes it easier to build and maintain muscle. Now this is crucial. 
without adequate protein, uh, without you know enough protein in the body, we can't function as well. We just don't. We need amino acids, which are you know the, the building blocks of, of of being jacked, right? Like proteins, building blocks are aminos to produce important molecules like the enzymes, the hormones, the neurotransmitters, and the antibodies. So when you don't eat enough protein, your body is struggling and it's i guess in reality like our body plunders it from elsewhere it's trying to pull from other places like our muscles resulting in muscle loss so the more protein you eat and you can have that aminos to stream in your bloodstream you're going to be able to be you know jacked and if you go out in the sun jacked and tan a little bit longer and this is especially true if you're eating fewer calories than you're burning right now that's the key if you're not getting enough protein in your life and you're eating at like this deficit it's going to start to eat away at the muscle tissue. And that's the, that's the, what we don't want, right? I don't think any... Like people say, Jeremy, I build muscle so quick. I'm like, really? Who are you? Like, who who are you? You're a, you're, you're a unicorn out here? I've never had one. I've heard, and I love, ladies, I love you. You're stronger than us. Your pain tolerance is higher than us. You are smarter than us. But sometimes I've heard women say things like, Jeremy, I build muscle so fast. I build muscle super quickly. I've never heard a dude say that. I've been doing this for 15 years. I meet a lot of dudes. Some of them jacked, some of them not. I've never heard a dude say, Jeremy, I build muscle so quick and so easy, just happens instantly. So take that for what it is. Um, on the flip side of what we're talking about, a high protein diet seems to maximize muscle protein synthesis, which should lean to more muscle gain for people who strength train if they're consuming enough calories. No, that's the key. If you're trying to build muscle, you have to be in a surplus. You cannot build muscle tissue, get super jacked in a deficit. So I've talked about this a million times before. You, you can't get jacked and shredded at the same time. Even the dudes in the best drugs, that's not happening. Now, the only instance where some of that could happen is like the beginner gains stage, the 14, 15, 16 year olds, sure. But the rest of us, past the novice level, it's not gonna happen. Or if you're like 400 pounds, it just, it isn't gonna work that way. If you're going to build muscle and be bigger, you need to eat more. If you're going to be more shredded, you need to eat less. The reason we say eat more protein when you're in that deficit phase is you want your body to strip away the fat and keep as much, you're gonna lose some muscle for sure, but you wanna keep as much lean muscle as you can and get rid of all the stuff around it. It's kind of like, you're, it's like a snowman, right? You've seen that before. The It's probably been on Instagram and Facebook for years. It's like a giant snowman and somebody with carved enough of it out where the snowman starts to look shredded. That's what I, I, I picture in my brain what is happening when you're eating the right way. You're, you're, you're taking a chisel, doom, boom, 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 and stripping away all the shit that's there and leaving just the jacked muscle tissue. That's the goal. And that's probably one of the reasons why high protein diets are better for improving body composition than a normal low protein diet. And in this PN article, there was a view of uh, 38 studies found that people who are out of shape, who are consuming extra protein, won't magically build any muscle. There's obviously no surprise there. But people who are really pushing themselves in the gym eating more protein seem to boost their results, helping them gain even more muscle. So what does that mean for you kids at home? The right amount of protein for each person obviously varies on a number of factors such as age, gender, and goals. That's why when we do our programs, we have people set up macros, we have a general calculator, and then when they chime in, I ask them how often you're training, what are you eating now, what is your age, and then we try to give them a baseline of macros to follow, protein being one of them, and give them something to move forward. So someone who is interested in packing on muscle for, say, a bodybuilding competition or to look sexy on the beach or whatever their goal is, they might aim for as many as 50 grams of protein, about two palm size fulls at every single meal. Someone hoping to work off, let's say an extra 20 pounds is gonna need much less protein than that, in my opinion. And obviously there's a ton of free protein calculators out there. We have a free macro guide I'm happy to send you guys, where basically you just plug in your info and it'll show you you know, what's the uh, the baseline amounts of proteins, carbs, and fats based on individual goals and how active you are and what you're trying to do. Hopefully you're with me so far. Principle number three, as food processing increases, the nutrient density decreases. Now, obviously minimally processed whole foods such as 
grains, nuts, eggs, fish contain a vast selection of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, which are aka the plant nutrients, and the zoo nutrients, which are the animal nutrients. Hopefully you guys are learning some things today. Though we're still kind of unraveling exactly which nutrients do what in the world, a wealth of research has consistently pointed to a bunch of conclusions. Humans are healthier when they consume more whole foods than fewer refined ones. I know that is a shocker, so I'm going to repeat that statement and drill it home to everybody. Humans are healthier when they consume more whole foods than refined ones. Boom. Mind is blown here. And it's probably because there's a greater a degree of processing and a higher likelihood that food, when it is processed, has lost a nutritional value. It has lost things like fiber essential fatty acids, vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and the zoo nutrients. And it has gained additives like preservatives, fillers, sugar, sodium, which has been added, unhealthy fats, and refined starches. This is a lot easier to see when you compare whole foods to the highly processed ones. And so if you guys are picturing something at home, think of beneficial nutrients in your brain. And then picture on one plate, on my left, fast food burger with fries about 920 calories, about 1,000 milligrams of sodium. Then picture a plate on my right, six ounces of tenderloin, medium baked potato, two cups of steamed broccoli, about 560 calories and 100 milligrams of sodium. And so when you break that down, you're looking at maybe 60 grams of protein with the burger, but 90 grams of protein over with the steak and potatoes. You're looking at, in terms of let's say vitamin C, like 100, and like zero with the burgers and fries. Like I could break it down as you go, but obviously common sense knows if you're listening to me, you understand if you're eating a steak, potatoes, and broccoli, it's a better choice than a burger and french fries. Now obviously I'm, I'm telling you guys to live your life, but that's just one comparison. And again, I'm all for a fan of you going to eat pizza and have beers with your friends like once a week. Be a real person. But if you're eating processed shit consistently seven days a week and you're wondering why you're not as healthy and fit as you want to be there you go and again that's just one comparison you could analyze any whole food along with the refined counterparts and see the difference in calories and sodium and nutrients so it makes sense the diet rich in minimally processed whole foods can lead to lower rates of heart disease cancer depression type 2 diabetes among other health problems that's why I always say eat real food. Real food's the base of everything you do. I don't give a shit if you're paleo, keto, intermittent fasting, carb backloading, carnivore, whatever works for you. I just think a diet that is rich in real food and minimally processed. Notice I say minimally processed. I'm not telling you to be a saint. I'm not telling you to be a monk out there just doing yoga, listening to Yanni, chewing on fucking granola. That's not healthy either. Unless you really love it, then please go do it. But for most of you, you can have chips once in a while. Like you can have cookies once in a while. You just can't do that shit all the time. And obviously minimally processed whole foods that you would fill your typical day with are rich in fiber and protein and nutrients that help bolster satiety, meaning you're satisfied for longer, which helps you eat fewer calories per serving than the highly processed refined counterparts. So understanding that when you're eating healthy stuff, you can eat so much more. The volume is so much greater and you're not as hungry as often. When you go eat that shit like cookies, which full disclaimer, my, my, my mom's still here, Dave is here, Heather's at home. I might go pick up crumble cookies and they always like, oh, Jeremy, you keep bringing these every weekend and I'll do it like once a week or I'll pick up something for the, cause I think it's fun. And they're like, oh, we hate it. Secretly, they fucking love it. And they, they're waiting for me to do it. Uh, they're just full of shit. And, it, and partially why I do it for you guys, because I know they're going to eat 90% of it and they'll only leave me a little bit. That way I don't got to eat as many. So I get my fix. It's like doing a little bit of crack. I don't got to do all the crack. They're going to do most of it. And I only have to do a little bit of it. So I'm joking, obviously, when I say that, but it's the truth. Like, I'm a fan of doing it little by little. Now, what I've noticed is when you eat cookies like that, like, and again, if you're a cookie person or chips or whatever your thing is, it is so addicting. That dopamine hits your brain, it, it makes you feel like you want to just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And it, it ramps up being hungry. It makes you crave it. 
When you eat cauliflower, it does not happen. When you eat broccoli, it does not happen. That's why I say if you can focus on whole foods, it's a lot of food volume you can eat, it's super dense, and you tend to eat fewer calories than the highly processed stuff. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Now, obviously, all these things, when you can fill the body with real food, it makes it easier to control your weight. And if you're gonna go with some of these studies here, there's a randomized control um, found that people eating, uh, let's say, 500 calories, or excuse me, I'm gonna put it this way. There's a randomized control trial even found that people ate a stunning 500 more calories per day when they consumed a diet rich in ultra processed foods compared to a diet rich in minimally processed whole foods. That's essentially the equivalent to consuming an extra meal every single day. Now for one day, not a big deal, but over the course of a year or two years or three years, you're talking thousands of extra meals you're eating because it is that, that processed shit that makes you crave it so much more. In fact, minimally processed whole foods may be what all successful diets share in common. And I believe that. I'll repeat that statement because I said it quickly. Minimally processed whole foods, the things that run, that swim, that fly, that grow from the earth as natural as can be, are, in my opinion, what all successful diets share in common. So again, regardless of the eating style, and I'm not against anything, I've tried damn near everything other than like fruititarian or vegetarian because I just have no interest in it whatsoever. I'm not knocking it, it's just, it's not for me. I'm a meat eater and I will be till the day that I die. But I do think that's what all healthy diets share in common. We're just eating real whole foods. Now there is studies that have shown that for people who um, experience the same amount of weight loss, regardless of carb or fat intake, as long as they minimize their consumption of refined sugars, flours, and processed foods, and emphasized whole foods and veggies, did great. And so that's why I never vilify carbs. I don't, you know, vilify fats or proteins or put anything on, on a pedestal. I just always phrase it as carbohydrates are the most easily overeaten of the macronutrients. That's why I just, I tell people to be mindful of them. But understand that people that eat real food, they are gonna experience improvements in blood pressure, insulin, uh, glucose, and cholesterol levels. That's just how it's gonna be. So what does it mean for you? It means that I'm 100% confident about the importance of eating real food, and I'm also confident that progress is much more important than perfection, which I preach in every program we ever do. So rather than, you know, getting so hung up on the details and getting hung up on being perfect, just make the best choice you can each day and pick your spots and eat your, your, your cheats and your treats when you do, but make sure the base of what you're doing is whole, real, nutrient-dense foods. Obviously, you know, eating sweet potatoes is probably a better choice than eating sweet potato pie. Not that you can't have it, but have one on the regular and have one more sparingly. Obviously we know having an apple is probably better than eating, you know, apple cinnamon, applesauce muffins, but just do the best you can with what you have. Obviously understand that eating, you know, fresh whole shrimp is better than eating popcorn shrimp. Understand that eating shelled peanut butter is better than eating peanut butter cookies. But again, they all have their place, but just know the base of what you do should be the real food not the refined alternative. And the goal with Whole Foods isn't to get things perfect. It's focused on making them just a little bit better day after day, week after week, month after month, becoming a healthier person over time. A rotisserie chicken from the supermarket may not be pasteurized, uh, lovingly hand-raised heritage, you know, uh, in the best, you know, setting ever, but it sure beats eating fucking chicken nuggets, man. It really does. That's what I'm talking about. It, it might not always be organic and free range and, and perfect, but you know what's a better choice than not. Common sense would tell you that. And if you don't have it, obviously listening to this podcast long enough, you're learning the very basic stuff that can at least help you be healthier. Now, principle number four, fruit and vegetables reduce disease and may help you lose weight too. I'll put it this way. Fruits and vegetables will help you reduce the risk of disease and are gonna help you lose weight too if it's done properly. Now, fruits and vegetables are loaded with healthy 
antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, fiber, and phytonutrients. And there's a huge body of evidence from probably about the past 20 years that show consuming more produce can help you prevent a wide range of health problems, including diabetes, stroke, heart disease, high blood pressure, and cancer. That, my friend, should be reason enough to throw these vitamins and minerals into your life daily and consistently. Hence, I can't eat enough veggies every single day. I love fruit, but if I get going on fruit, I'll overeat on it because I'm an idiot uh, and I'm a fat kid at heart. So I throw in what I can, but I also crush athletic greens. That's a huge part of what I do because I'm a real person. I'm not gonna eat 10 servings of greens per day, but I'll eat as many as I can. Hence, I'll take the athletic greens. If you guys wanna try them, hit me up. I'll get you 20 free travel packs. If you're really Jeremy, I don't know. I'll have Monica someone right to your front door. You can try it, make the call for yourself, and then I'll hook you up with the 20 free. Boom. So with that said, if I give you an example, by simply increasing your vegetable, vegetable and fruit intake, um, there is experts that predict you could prevent 20% or more of all cancer cases and avoid approximately 200,000 cancer-related deaths annually. That's fucking crazy. Actually, that's the first time I've been reading that. Let me say it again. For example, by simply increasing your vegetable and fruit intake, experts predict that you could prevent 20% or more of all cancer cases and avoid approximately 200,000 cancer-related deaths annually. And they have some sources here uh, to cite this. And I'm happy to give you guys this full breakdown if you want to read it somewhere else. That's actually insane. And that's what I'm talking, that's the shit I'm talking about, man. Like, that's what irritates me, is that we don't talk about this enough, or that the platforms that are sharing this aren't the biggest ones in the world. That's what I do think is criminal. We spend so much time, like these major news platforms and outlets, sharing information that is not as important and is not as relevant, but we could be sharing this right now and drilling it home all the time to people, scaring the shit out of them to make them healthier, we could easily do it. But yeah, we don't, because you know why? There's no money in it. I don't want to get on that soapbox today, but man, that really pisses me off. Anyways, an increasing number of studies also suggest that consuming a diet rich in antioxidants and anti-inflammatory foods, such as fruits and vegetables, may lower your risk of developing neurodegenerative diseases. And when it comes to cognitive performance, food beats supplements all day. If you can't do the food, then do the supplements. But if you can eat the real food, that is crucial, my friends. Once nutrients such as antioxidants are isolated and produced in certain capsules, they can lose um, some of their power. Not all the time, but it can happen. So I always say if you can eat the real food, do it, but supplement around that. That is crucial. Now, obviously, an eating pattern rich in produce can help you easily control your weight. This Effect is thanks to the fiber and the water content in these foods, which helps fill you up on fewer calories. An example I could give you guys is like an entire head of cauliflower, for example, contains only about 150 calories. An entire head of cauliflower contains only 150 calories. Two tablespoons of peanut butter, which no normal rational human can eat because literally there's nothing when it comes to two tablespoons of peanut butter, is like 200 plus calories. A Justin's peanut butter or almond butter packet, go squeeze that thing out. I mean, roll that shit like your toothpaste and squeeze it out. There is nothing in there. It's like three licks. It doesn't even, that ain't even enough to get you excited, man. That ain't even, just, that ain't even, that's not even the tip. That is not even enough to get things moving the right way. So understand that. And again, I'm feeling in peanut butter, almond butter. I love it. But to paint a picture, like how much is 150 calories of a Snickers bar? Is it half of a Snickers bar? Um, give or take, it's like, is that a Reese's peanut butter cup? Is that a, like half of one Twix? But yet an entire head of cauliflower is 150 calories. That's the key. So what does this mean for you? No one fruit or veggie is king, but rather than sticking to just like one magic, you know, power food, for example, uh, eating blueberries every single day, aim for a variety and try to eat a wide rainbow of colors every single day. And uh, even if you hate veggies, you could always do athletic greens. But again, you can even take your, your veggies, and depending on the way that you cook them, salt, pepper, oil, 
uh, put salsa on them, dip them in guacamole, avocado, all those things. There's a lot of stuff. You'll find something you like. And there's a couple of diehards that I like, but I like blueberries. I like bananas. I like apples. I like oranges. What did we eat the other day? Did I have a different kind of fruit? We did like, went, we took Heather to uh, horseback riding for her uh, birthday. And I was, you should have seen me, man. I was like rip out there from Yellowstone. I was just killing it. No, all jokes aside, I was more like Jimmy. But uh, we took her there, and then there's this uh, winery uh, close to Sedona. It sucks. Don't go there. Um, called Page Springs Flowers. It's actually amazing. Super cool place. I don't drink wine, so I just had cold brew coffee. Um, I just don't understand. I don't get the wine thing. Uh, whiskey? I, I'm, I'm down with that. But uh, the wine? No. Uh, anyways, we're there, and uh, they brought out this big, uh, what, how do you say it? A charcuterie board? Charcuterie board? I don't, I, don't, I don't know if anybody ever says that right. Anyways, they brought it out and it was like super dope, ton of stuff. But they had like, there was ma was there dried mangoes on there, and was it plums? I think there was plums on there and so a couple other things. And I'm like, you forget how much you love certain fruits when you don't have them and how they are really like nature's dessert. They're pretty amazing. But anyways, uh, I like all the fruits and I like to throw them into my life. I just I gotta be cautious because I could easily eat, you know, three bananas and two apples at once and half a jar of peanut butter later. You know, I might as well just had a cookie, but all jokes aside, I, I do think adding in fruits and veggies into your life is key and, and get as many of them as you can. Try the ones that you like and then obviously, you know, supplement around that if you, if you find yourself not getting enough of those micros daily. And then last principle before I let you guys go, I'm getting hungry. Sleep. Sleep affects what you eat as well as your overall health. And now I've been working with people a long time. Uh, 15 years overall, almost 11 years on my own, and sleep is uh, is a big one for a lot of people. And people can nail everything with their nutrition, but still struggle with reaching their goals. And oftentimes it's because they're not getting enough sleep. And I've been guilty of this before in the past. As I've gotten older, I've gotten a lot better just for the fact of uh, I can't get away with as much shit anymore. I can only, uh, you know, we used to say, in our office when Dave and Ben were still with me, we would, uh, we were, again, we're, we're all three dudes in our 20s. So testosterone is running high and uh, we're just a, a bunch of dipshits. And we would wear, you know, being tired is like a badge of honor, right? Like we really would. And we would be on the, you know, sleep is the new broke. We, we, we would say that a lot. Sleep is the new broke. And like, I only slept three hours last night and I worked this much. And it would be kind of, you know, who could, you know, outwork who but at the cost of getting sleep and it was just it's really stupid and when I was young I could probably do that but now if I go a day I can probably make it one day but then I do pay for it for sure and I just I crash like a ton of bricks and so the biggest thing is you, you have to really make sleep uh, important and when people aren't getting enough sleep and they're not prioritizing it their results are going to suffer even if they could do everything else right which honestly if you're not sleeping good it's very rare you can do everything else correctly. And if you sleep five or six hours a night when you really need seven or eight, you know, some people can get by on more or less. It just depends who you are. I think my body can optimally run on less than a lot of other people's. I'm not just saying that uh, because what I do for a living, I really do feel that way. But I can tell the difference if I get, you know, three, four, five hours of sleep, that's not gonna be enough for me over the long haul. So if you're a person who sleeps five, six hours a night, when you really need seven or eight, your body's gonna be in this chronically sleep deprived state. It's gonna impair your body's ability to regulate several key hormones. Now, if your hormones are off and they're fighting against you, you can eat good, you can train hard, but man, it's like ice skating uphill, bro. That shit is really hard to do. Um, your ghrelin levels uh, are gonna uh, trigger hunger. Um, your leptin levels, um, it's gonna take longer for you to feel full, which is gonna be a huge problem. So the two things you don't want is uh, to trigger hunger and you don't want your leptin to drop so it takes longer to feel full. And you don't want the perception of food to seem more pre excuse me, pleasurable than it is uh, over time. And that's, that's a tough one. So the end result is, you know, you can't keep yourself away from the cookies, right? Or the cinnamon rolls or the whatever your, your jam is. And so by not getting enough sleep, 
you're just hungrier and you crave sweets more uh, than you otherwise would. You're also tired, so you probably exercise and move less or you have shittier workouts. You're awake more time, which for most people means they raid the kitchen more. They find themselves in front of the fridge over and over and over again for really no reason, opening it 17 different times, even though nothing changes there. So the bottom line is sleep deprived people tend to eat at least 300 more calories per day than the people who get enough sleep. In addition to interfering with weight loss, lack of sleep also erodes your health. Just one night of sleep deprivation can lead to increased blood pressure the following day. Each year, when nearly 1.5 billion people lose an hour of sleep due to daylight savings time, rates of heart attacks jump. That is crazy. That's the first time I'm reading that too. Let me read that again so I'm not giving you guys crazy information. They have studies to back all this up too uh, and references, or at least looks like some analysis below. Just one night of sleep deprivation can lead to increased blood pressure the next day. Each year, when nearly 1.5 billion people lose an hour of sleep due to daylight savings time, rates of heart attacks jump. That is insane. Luckily, I live in Arizona. We don't practice that daylight savings nonsense because it's always the same time here every single day, 365. If you guys didn't know that, we do not practice daylight savings time in Arizona. We're our own thing. Um, so what does this mean for you? Most people aren't sleeping enough. Obviously, we know that. Uh, going to bed at midnight and getting up at 6 probably isn't going to cut it for most people. So there's a lot of sleeping hacks, obviously, you guys can do and, and throw in. I've talked about it before. Uh, making the room dark, making it cold, uh, logging off with technology uh, about 30 to 60 minutes before you go to sleep. I personally take the Beam uh, Dream product. I'm a fan of the CBD. There's no THC in it. You're not going to get high, although they did just pass the, the 207 here where you will legally be able to smoke weed in Arizona like crazy if you want to. But the Beam stuff does not have any of that in there. So it's just CBD to help you sleep. There's melatonin. There's theanine in it. If you guys are interested, I can always get you 20% off. And I'm happy to send you uh, some of the Beam packs to your house so you can try them to see how it does help you with sleep. I have found that uh, I feel better when I, uh, I take it and I find that my quality of sleep is, uh, is much, much higher when, uh, when I take that. And I don't wake up as often. That's probably the biggest key. So obviously this is it. You know, these are the basic things that I think a lot of people need to just understand uh, if they want to be healthier with their eating habits uh, and their drinking habits and overall what they're trying to you know, get out of their fitness journey and the results. Because at the end of the day, like, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of misinformation uh, about nutrition and fitness out there. And you can go down any rabbit hole you want. And there's a lot of things that work for a lot of people. But at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's the basic principles that are going to make the biggest difference for all of you guys. And if you're, oh, Jeremy, I don't know. You know, I, I'm not sure you're right on all these things. Let me ask you this. How many people do you know who consistently are doing all of the things I'm about to list well? Like how many super unhealthy, like people who are overweight, they have terrible mobility, they don't feel good, they don't look the way they want. How many of these people are consistently eating an appropriate amount of calories for their body and their goals? How many of them are consuming enough protein, choosing mostly minimally processed whole foods? getting lots of fruits and veggies, sleeping enough, and eating slowly and mindfully. Unhealthy people aren't doing that. Those are things that healthy people do. Now, these aren't sexy, they're not exciting, they're not trendy, but for most people, if you simply follow those principles most of the time, you're gonna get the results that you want. Plus, you're not wasting time doing all these other radical, crazy things and all this really advanced stuff when you're not really ready for it. So remember, nutrition science, you know, may not have all the answers, but it has a lot of answers for a lot of things. And again, the takeaway here for all of you listening, the biggest keys, eating an appropriate amount of calories for your body and your goals. If you want to throw in tracking macros for composition, I'm cool with that. Consume enough protein. Eat whole, real, hashtag real food hustle, real whole nutrient dense foods. 
less processed food, eat more fruits and veggies, get enough sleep, and eat slow and eat mindful, and drink water. And you can eat some shit and drink some shit along the way, but just don't do it every single day. That's it. Again, all stuff you guys probably already know, but maybe didn't know in such detail, and hopefully we could debunk any craziness out there so you don't have to do keto or paleo or anything else super crazy. At the end of the day, just take the basics of what work and build from there. And don't worry about being perfect. Just worry about making a little progress over time. And don't beat yourself up. If you had a drink you didn't plan on having, or you ate some shit you shouldn't have ate, learn from it, ask yourself why, audit, and then move forward. And just be active every single day along the way. And you guys are going to be okay. So those, my friends, would be the five principles of healthy nutrition, eating, and hopefully helping you get to all of your goals and hopes and dreams in fitness and how you want to look a little bit faster. At least doing it uh, in a way that is sustainable, not just for the short term, but for the long haul. So thank you guys for listening to that. Again, a reminder, our 50 days of fitness fat loss challenge is kicking off here in three days on November the 11th. Today is November the 7th. So you got three days left to register. Hit me up if you want a small podcast discount code. I'm happy to help you. And please share this podcast with a friend or family member who maybe has their head up their butt or just you think could benefit from hearing some very basic sound advice that can help them get out of a funk and move better and feel better and live a healthier life for not just a year, but for the next 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, however long they're going to be on this earth and avoid some of the common pitfalls and mistakes a lot of people make along the way. So if you happen to be on iTunes right now, stop. Don't be a lazy ass. Drop me a five star. Leave a couple of comments. I truly would appreciate it. It means the world to us. And if you're watching on YouTube, thank you guys. I appreciate it. If you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, make sure you guys do. We got over 1,300 videos on there. Everything for free and gives you the updates when you subscribe right to your inbox. So I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. I gotta get out of here. So thank you guys. I appreciate you more than you know. Have an amazing rest of your Saturday. And until next time, eat well, train hard, be nice to people. And please, you guys, keep doing shit you love, people you enjoy, because your life is too short not to. I'll talk to you soon. Peace.